And here we are on the last uh, last lecture of this class. I know you guys are probably excited about that. Probably not near as much as I am. <laughs> I get tired of teaching just like you guys get tired of listening, tired of writing. So we're almost done. Uh, as promised, I'm going to work through a couple of uh, sample problems today about fluid dynamics. Uh, this should get you all the information you need for the last test. I'm writing the last test right now. Uh, it will publish uh, on Monday and it will be due uh, probably a week from Monday then. Uh, I think that's when the final would normally be for this class because it's an online class. I kind of have a little bit of leeway for what I can do. Uh, so that's when uh, what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to publish. Again, I know there's a lot of material so don't expect to dig really deep uh, on a lot of anything. Uh, however, I'm considering the uh, last couple of questions. Remember, like I said, they're going to be very similar to what the second exam was, where you'll have a bunch of stuff that comes from the homework, and then two or three things of my own devising. Uh, and I'm considering making at least one of those something that's kind of going to incorporate everything that we've done this semester. Uh, so a little bit comprehensive, but not entirely. And as I think you've seen, physics just by its nature is pretty comprehensive anyway. Uh, if you don't understand previous chapters, then you're going to struggle in the, the following chapters as you've seen. So uh, I will be around for a lot of the time between now and finals. So if you have questions, uh, concerns, if you want to talk about material, uh, feel free to email me, stop by my office, do whatever we need to do to set this up. So let's start with a pretty simple problem. So let's say that We have a some kind of bucket of water, some fluid. And let's say that the depth of this thing is 80 centimeters. And somewhere right about here, there's a hole. And that hole, let's say, is 40 centimeters from the bottom. We know the water comes out of that hole with some velocity. So what we want to do is calculate the velocity of the water coming out. Well, how are we going to do that? First of all, we're going to need a couple of assumptions. So let's assume that we're doing this on Earth, or at least somewhere that has Earth-like gravity. And we're going to assume that, just to make the math easy, we're going to assume our acceleration, assume our acceleration due to gravity is 10 meter per second squared. Yes, I know, it's really closer to 9.81, but for the purposes of the example, we're just going to call it 10 because it'll make them happy. So what do we need to know? Well, if we approach this like an energy problem, you can think of this almost in the same way that we did the drop the baseball off the building problem. Right away, we can see that the water is basically the pressure is going to come from up here, right? So we need to know what this distance is. It's going to help us a lot. So how are we going to get that? Well, that's pretty easy. So distance, that's going to be, you know what? I labeled that wrong. So 
So it's 85 centimeters. It's not going to matter much. So we're going to take our total of 85. We're going to subtract our 40 from that. And that's going to give us 45 centimeters. We still have to do one thing, though. Remember, when we talk about physics problems, when we talk about velocities, accelerations, momentums, that kind of thing, we expect everything to be in SI units. In other words, if we're talking about, for example, we're going to use gravity as in meters per second squared. You can do two things here because your measurements are in centimeters. You can either change centimeters to meters or you can change gravity from meters per second squared to centimeters per second squared, as long as your units are the same. It's a whole lot easier to convert this distance from centimeters to meters. And so it should be no surprise, and you should be able to do this in your head at this point, that that's about 0.45 meters. All right. So what now? We know that the water that leaves the hole is going to have the same speed as if this was just in free fall, right? The water is effectively falling from here to here. So it's going to have some velocity. If we go back to our kinematics equations, we will remember, if you don't, you can derive it or go back and review your notes from that chapter. We find that we have an expression for the velocity in this case, that's 2GH. So why do we need this equation? Because I don't know anything about time. I need a time independent solution for this problem. There is a way you can do this that's actually way, way easier and I think much more interesting, but it requires calculus. And the way we would do this in calculus is we would look at this as a rate of change. So we'd look at how quickly the water flows from the tank or from this container and be able to find that through calculus, understanding the relationship between velocity, acceleration, distance from a calculus standpoint. But we don't have that tool. So we're left with a problem where we don't know anything about time. So just remember, if you want to know anything about velocities and you don't have a time, remember you have the time-independent velocity equation, which is this. So that means that V then has got to be equal to square root of 2GH, or we have to get rid of the square. So again, be very careful when we're doing these kind of problems. Be careful to convert, make sure your units are correct. And if you have anything like this, don't forget the square. If you forget the square, you're going to end up getting pretty screwed, right? You're going to get a bad answer. So if we do this, if we assume that uh, we use 10 for acceleration due to gravity, so what we're going to get <coughs> is something looks like root 2 times 10 times 0.45. Well, what does that look like? That looks like 2 times 0.45, or 4.5, sorry, that's the 10. That's 2 times 4.5, that's 9. So we get so it looks like root 9, which is just 3. Now, you could, if you were not convinced, you can put all your units in there. But I'm going to tell you right now that this is right. 
This is in meters per second. I encourage you to do that on the test uh, and on any homework assignments that you get. Because if you forget to do a unit conversion and you don't put units and you just come out with a number, I have no way to know if that was because you missed a unit conversion or if you just didn't know what you were doing. So by putting your units in here and proving to me that this is the unit you get out, that helps you a lot. It gives me a lot of leeway for squeezing out as many points as I can out of that uh, problem for you. So we get a velocity of three meters per second. Well, that's exactly what we were asked to find, right? We wanted to know the velocity of the water coming out of this container. So this is 85 centimeters. Um, that's what, about four and a half inches or so? So this is a small drinking glass and we put a hole in it. And that hole, that water's gonna come out of there three meters per second, pretty slow. Now let's say, for example, that I'm standing in front of this as this water comes out. Is this gonna be enough to knock me down? Probably not. At three meters per second, the thing we would need to know would be something about density, right? So we need to know the density of water, we need to know the mass of the water coming out, and then we can do a collision problem. We could just do a momentum thing. Uh, and you'll find that this small volume of water does not have enough mass at three meters per second to create enough momentum to move me at all. This is why uh, a lot of times you'll see if there's like a riot or something that the, the police will often employ water cannons. Uh, what they'll do is they have basically a giant tank and they pump water through it at very, very high pressure, a very small aperture. So now you increase this velocity. So even the density, even though the density of the water is low at an extremely high velocity, it has a lot of momentum and that's enough to knock somebody over. And so that's why you'll see water cannons employed a lot of times with this non-lethal, uh, it's a way to knock people over to means of propulsion. Uh, we actually used this principle in the early days of spaceflight uh, on the Gemini program, uh, which was our second manned spaceflight. Uh, we did our first spacewalk, a uh, guy called Ed White, uh, who died in the Apollo 1 fire. Ed White was the first American to do a spacewalk, and one of the things he did is he had a gun that was effectively two little cylinders of air with a tube that faced backwards. And when he squeezed the trigger, the gas shoots back towards him, creating an equinox force. And so he's able to use this thing to move. Uh, and so this is how he would maneuver around in space. Of course, he was tethered to the spacecraft. And there were a lot of other issues that are really interesting. If you want to go read about the first spacewalk, uh, with Ed White, there's some really, really interesting stuff there about like how he couldn't get back in the capsule and he almost died. <laughs> uh, but very interesting history nonetheless. So we're using this same kind of technique here. Now, of course, if we start playing with the idea of air resistance and non-uniform fluid density and non-uniform size of the aperture, then that gets a little more difficult to do. So that's why we're not going to do these. So let's look at another one. Uh, so we have another of the same kind of problem. So here we have some bucket of water and it's one and a half meters high. And we put a hole in the thing down here. 
And let's say that that is 25 centimeters from the bottom of the bucket. And what we'd like to know is how fast the water comes out. Before we start plugging numbers in, let's think about the answer that we should get. Think about what this kind of should look like. Remember in the previous example, we had kind of a similar setup, right? Except this was, I say it was 85 centimeters and this was 40 centimeters. And we got a velocity out of that about three meters per second. What's the difference? So here, our hole is only 25 centimeters above the ground, and this is one and a half meters tall. I'm six feet tall, that's about one and a half meters. Maybe a little bit more, it might be like close to like 1.65 or something. Uh, but, so you're talking about a guy that's a bucket of water that's about my height, and we poke a hole in that bucket of water that's 25 centimeters. Uh, an inch is three centimeters, roughly. So we're talking about a hole that's not quite an inch above the ground. We should be able to intuit that this velocity, I guess, guess that it's greater than three meters a second. That would make sense, right? Uh, there was an interesting story in the news a couple weeks ago uh, that you guys might have seen where there was a water tower somewhere. I don't remember where it was, somewhere in rural Arkansas or Mississippi or something. And on this giant water tower, there was a mural or a uh, a painting or silhouette of Johnny Cash, and somebody had shot it with a small caliber weapon uh, right in a uh, very inconvenient place on the silhouette, and water starts spraying out, and it looks like Johnny Cash is taking a whiz, and that water came out of there pretty fast. So this is basically what we're doing here, right? So how do we solve this problem? We know we expect anyway that this velocity is going to be greater than three meters a second. We're going to do the same thing. We need to know the height that we're dealing with. So we have to take our looking for this distance, right? So remember, our distance has got to be one and a half meters minus this. Don't forget unit conversion. This is 25 centimeters, so that ends up being 0.25 meters. So that leaves me a distance of 1.25 meters. Pretty easy, right? Well, I want to know what the velocity is. So again, we go V squared equals 2 mgh. Well, let's just do the square root here. V equals root 2 mgh. So that's root uh, two, oh, two G8, it's not MG8, I'm an idiot. It's like, where did I get my maths from? So two, we're gonna assume gravity's 10 again, H is 1.25. So that is what? Uh, 12 and a half times two, 12 and a half times two. That gives me 25. Root 25 is five meters per second. So in fact, the velocity of the water exiting the bucket is about five meters per second, which is greater than the three meters a second we had over there, which is what we expected. 
So I'm okay with that answer. So this is pretty easy. But let's do something a little more difficult and a little more interesting. By the way, if you want to practice doing these, aside from the homework, do exactly what I did about 10 minutes before class. I just Googled fluid dynamics problems and came up with a million of them. So these are just some that I found online that I thought were interesting. So something a little more interesting. Let's have a hundred centimeter tall box full of water. This time we're gonna poke two holes in. And we're gonna have water come out of the holes. So let's say that the distance from the top to this first hole, we call it D1, is 20 centimeters. And let's say that the distance from the bottom hole to the ground is 50 centimeters. Now we know that these things are gonna come out at different velocities. The uh, velocity of the water is gonna be different. Now we know that just from the previous example, the hole that's closer to the ground is gonna have the velocity of the water coming out is gonna be faster. So it's going to go a further distance than this. So we're going to say this distance is X. And we're going to say this distance is Y. Look at my camera again. Make sure you guys can see that. Yeah. So. What we'd like to know is not just velocity, right? We'll call it D2. Sorry. So this has got some velocity V1, it's got some velocity D2. We want to find the ratio of X to Y. In other words, how much further does this go than this? A little more interesting problem, I think. Well, what are we going to do? How are we going to solve this? First of all, even now, I want you to watch how we do this. I want you to pay attention here because. This is kind of a good problem to demonstrate the methodology of solving physics problems. So we know what we're trying to find. And I know the first time you see this problem, you probably go, I just don't have enough information. You're right, you don't, not initially. So we need to find the other information. So remember, I did not explicitly in the problem tell you V1, Vj, okay? This would be the initial setup of the problem. Now you define that ratio. So what I have to do is think about what's going on. I've seen this kind of problem before. And what I've done with this kind of problem before is I've found these velocities. So we'll call that V1 and we'll call that V2. Now, what am I going to do with that? I don't know yet. 
I do, you know. Uh, let's, but I'm trying to approach this as you would in your early physics career. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to start calculating things that I can and then think of clever ways to use them later on. Well, that means that I have to find V. So remember that our V1 is going to be root 2G H1. Well, I was calling it V, wasn't I? Trying to be consistent. And our V2 has got to be root 2G V2. Again, let's assume gravity is two meters per second squared, or 10 meters per second squared, sorry. If you plug in those numbers, what you'll find is that the velocity of one is two meters per second, and the velocity of two is root 10 meters per second. So recording. Yeah. So we find this. So what do we need to do? Remember, we want to find this ratio. So how do I find this ratio? Again, we're going to break this problem down. So we've just solved for these velocities. So what have I done now? I've basically eliminated everything happening prior to the hole. So I don't care what the source of this velocity was. I just know that I have some velocity, right? And what I'd like to find are these horizontal distances. Okay. Remember, that is a projectile problem, right? And we know that our range is initial position plus V naught T plus one half A T squared. We know that velocity is just V naught plus uh, AT. So what are we going to do with this? Well, let's take a look at these equations. What is our initial position? Our initial position is going to be zero. Why? because I'm a physicist and I'm lazy and I'm gonna pick my starting point to be zero because it's arbitrary, right? What is my initial velocity? Well, I don't know, right? Well, I do, but what do I really need here? I really need to know a time. I can't get this distance if I don't know a time, right? Because I don't know V naught, well, I do A, but I don't know T. So let's find out. So what we're going to find is that that free fall distance, H, is going to be one half A T squared. Notice this is a free fall distance. So this is as if I took this drop of water and I just dropped it and let it go straight down with no initial velocity. So our initial velocity goes away and we get a one half AT squared. Well, what's my initial height? In this case, initial height is going to be 100 minus 20, so that's 80. 
where it's in centimeters. So we got to go meters. That's 0 0.8. Here's our one half. And our A, we're going to say is 10 meters per second squared again. And we still don't know what time is. But now we can find it, right? This is pretty easy to do algebraically. We'll find that, remember, we've got to get a, uh, get rid of the squared. So P equals root 0 0.8. Uh, 10 times a half is five. So root 0 0.8 over five. And that's going to give you uh, 0 0.4 seconds. It's the time. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. So we know the time that it takes for the water to go from the first hole all the way to the ground is 0.4 seconds. Remember spherical count of vacuum, we're not worried about air resistance. So it doesn't matter if this is a horizontal, if this is a curve, if this is vertical, it's gonna take 0.4 seconds. Well, that was H1. What about H2? Well, that's one half AT squared. Well, what's H2? That's the second hole. So that's going to be 100. But we're going to have to get rid of 50 centimeters because remember, our hole is 50 centimeters up. So that means 50 centimeters, 0.5 meters. And then we get another one half, 10 times t squared, same algebra. And we come out with t equals root point, um, sorry, 0 0.1 seconds. Don't lose your square and don't lose your square root. I'm skipping a lot of steps algebraically here because I'm, on, I'm expecting you guys to actually know how to do basic algebra at this point. So what do I do now? Think about what we found. Now we know an initial velocity. We know how fast it comes out of the hole, V1, V2. And we know a time. So we're trying to find a range. Remember, we're trying to find a ratio. So we need both ranges, x and y. Well, I know what my times are now. And I go back to my kinematics equation. Remember, we used the kinematics equation before for this to determine free fall, because that's how we got the time. Now we're going to assume it's not in free fall. It has some initial velocity. Or well, we're going to use the same equation. We're still going to pick our starting position, x naught is zero. But now I know a v naught. I know a t, one half the constant. I know an a, that's acceleration due to gravity, 10. And we know a t again. So I have everything I need to solve this problem. So let's let me write this down again t, one plus. 0.45 seconds. And T2 was root 0 0.1 seconds. So that means that X is our X naught plus the V naught, which in this case is going to be V1 times T1 plus one half, A is our acceleration due to gravity, so that's just gonna be 10. And then our P1, don't forget the square. Y is gonna be our Y naught, plus remember Y is our second one, our V2. So we need T2 plus one half, 10, T2 squared. 
All right. I'm not going to bore you with the algebra again. I'm going to assume you know how to do algebra. And so what we're going to come up with is X is going to be 0 0.8 meters. And Y is going to be one meter. So not that much of a difference, right? But I needed to find the ratio. So that's 0 0.8 to one, right? So our ratio of x to y, x is 0 0.8, y is 1.0. So we can leave it like that if you want. You can do a little bit of algebra and find out that's the same thing as 8 to 10, do a little reduction. And what do we get out of it? we get something like four to five. It's a ratio, so if you like, five to five. So that means that if the water comes out here at one meter, then that means that's got to be four fifths of one meter, right? So a little less or a little more, sorry. So pretty easy to find. Now from that, what could you do? Once you know this ratio, if I give you any of these distances, either of these two distances, X or Y, look what you can do. You can back into the distance, right? If I know the ratio, of the distances. And I know one distance, I can find the other. So let's say I can find X. I'm given Y, I find X. Well, X is my range. So I can plug that in and I can work backwards. And depending on which piece of this equation I give you, you can find either the velocity of the water coming out of the hole, or you can find how high above the ground the hole is. It's all about just putting the pieces together. Like I said, this one's pretty fun. Uh, I like that problem because it adds, it kind of takes into account most everything we've done this semester, right? It does unit conversions. It does kinematics equations. It does fluid dynamics. It wouldn't be much of a threat for me to say there's a ping pong ball with a certain mass uh, that gets hit by this water stream and I give you the density of water and you can do a collision problem and find out how far the ping pong ball moves or how fast it moves. It wouldn't be too much of a stretch for me to ask you to find the pressure uh, in this vessel. It wouldn't be too much for me to ask to find the pressure differential between in here and here. So if we're going to try to make an airplane wing or something like this, we'll do that. Uh, so lots and lots of things I can do. If I wanted to be really cruel, I know, I never cool me, right? If I, if I wanted to be really mean, I can set up water on an incline, assume this thing is full, And we're going to have x, y, and z distances doing the same problem. But because I'm on this incline, now I have to account for the theta 
Well, the only thing that really changes, remember my acceleration due to gravity is that way. And our direction of motion is that way. So we need to find the gravitational acceleration along this axis. So that's just going to be G plus theta. That's really the only difference. That's the only thing you do different is you account for the theta. And remember how we did that in these kinematics equations. Once we knew velocities, once we knew theta, we could just do our sine cosine magic and find the physics. So even though that looks nasty, it's not really all that bad if you understand physics. And that has been the whole point of the semester. Do you understand physics? I know that some of the mathematics here might be a little challenging for you, especially if it's been a while since you've seen any of this. The point of this class is not necessarily to get the calculation, the number done correctly. The point is that you understand the physics. You can see how certainly, even without giving you any numbers here, I could have simply asked you to derive an expression for the ratio of those two distances. Now you wouldn't get a number out, you wouldn't get four fifths out of this. You'd get something in terms of V1, V2, V1, V2, and G. Same thing, right? You're just not plugging numbers in. I find that when you plug numbers in, that's where most students lose points because you forget a square, you forget a decimal place. If you do it symbolically with just the variables, you generally don't have to worry about that. That's physics, that's understanding the nature of mass, energy, motion, momentum, uh, things like that. So that's where I'm going to stop today and for the course. Remember, I will post the final for you guys on Monday. You'll have about a week to complete that. Expect the same format as you did last time. If you move along to Physics 2 uh, in the summer, I'm not teaching in the summer. I don't know who is. I think Dr. Blanton might be teaching Physics 2 in the summer. Uh, in the fall, I will probably teach at least one section of physics too. Uh, and I don't know what else. Uh, but if you move on to physics too, I hope that I will see you in one of those classes. If you don't, I understand and I hope you do well in the rest of your classes. And my office door is always open to you if you need help. So having said that, I will. Uh, in the lecture and the course and i will see you guys uh well whenever it is appropriate for me to see you bye